Welcome to a new episode of Nice and Sunny, the podcast. I am still coming at you from uh, Phnom Penh in Cambodia. In total, I'm staying here for 17 days. I uh, still have about five days left, four days left um, before traveling on. And I actually thought what I haven't really been doing properly yet is talk about some experiences, some learnings, uh, some thoughts that I had on the place where I'm actually traveling to, which makes a lot of sense because this should be also a travel podcast at the same time as a, I don't know, philosophical uh, podcast where I'm thinking about a lot of real life applications. But why not actually bring that together? And today is a bit of a heavy topic. So uh, I am going to warn you right away from the start. Um, there's a lot of graphical stuff I'm going to talk about. Was um, I will try and keep it to a minimum, but there are a few things that are quite gruesome and um, quite shocking. So if you do not want to hear things like that and rather have your reality of today be more positive and free of sad and negative aspects, um, you might want to skip this episode. I am going to talk a lot about some realities that other people have and um, use a little bit of a mirror on how we and I assume that most of us that are listening to podcasts and a podcast like this probably on our iPhones and and so on and so forth, probably quite privileged in the way that we can live and uh, lead our lives. So, yeah, today I'm going to talk about what I experienced here in Cambodia uh, in an unexpected way, which shook me awake in a way and which shook me in a way that I'm definitely going to carry for the rest of my life. I'm still not over it. It's um, a couple of days ago that, that I learned about the history uh, of Cambodia, basically the very recent history of, of Cambodia. It's only 40, 50 years ago that um, things went very, very wrong here. And um, we do not know much about it in our Western culture. It's not like we, we learn that part of our history lessons are the history of Cambodia. I definitely have never learned about this ever before. And I was thrown into this and completely obliviously, which again, of course, we have the internet. We could know everything about every country if we wanted to. And um, I should have done more research coming to Cambodia before I did. But because this was a bit different, because I was invited sort of for work to come here, I didn't treat it as a place that I normally would go to, because normally I would do the research and actually read a lot into the history of a country before going there. In this case, I didn't. And I know that's a mistake. And yes, shame on me. Um, the only thing I did was I was watched a, I watched a YouTube video about things you need to know when visiting Phnom Penh. So that was just for me to be prepared here because I've heard all these little, okay, it is a bit more dangerous. You have to watch your stuff because there are a lot of thieves around. And, you know, just to know some basics that I should know or some, you know, some cultural rules like you know, in Thailand, for example, like you should not step on a banknote um, because it's the face of the king on it. And so if you if you trample on that, that's that's not a good thing. That's like things like that are good to know, like little little things like that that can get you a long way um, in a country to respect the culture and respect the people. And yeah, so that's why I watched that video. And in that video, there was no mention whatsoever about the gruesome history that Cambodia had gone through um, about 45, 50 years ago. So yeah, this is, the title is Reality is Relative, and it's obviously going into relativism and all that. It's a big psychological, philosophical, science topic um, that I'm not really going to go into to more detail and trying to even giving an attempt to to um, dissect or take apart. This is this is a bit too much to actually go into the details of this. But you probably are aware of um, a lot of the talks around relativity and uh, reality and that everybody's reality is different, right? So, I mean, we have like the smallest, the smallest example in recent uh, history was like this dress, you know, the, the blue and silver, and what was it? Um, white and gold 
dress thing where everybody um, realized that people are seeing the world differently. And it was a bit of a shock to a lot of people um, because everybody thinks everybody's reality is the same. And it's not just about what you see with your own eyes or hear that can be different because our senses are simply different, but it's also the culture you grew up in, the, the childhood you had, the cultural environment you grew up in um, is something that can shape your reality in a different way than somebody else's. And yeah, so there's, there's a lot to it. This is a big, big, big topic. Um, there's probably hundreds of books, if not thousands, <laughs> written about this topic. Um, so I'm just going to go and tell you how I saw this um, and how I had this little experience with people's realities in this example of me being here in Cambodia and how I experienced this. So I'm going to tell you a lot of stuff um, that might be quite heavy to hear. Um, so once again, if, if you do not want to have something heavy today, if you want to have something positive, um, obviously I'm going to put a positive spin on it in the end, but um, it is quite a heavy topic. So um, if you want something else, uh, you'd rather maybe want to um, skip to a different podcast uh, at this point. But I do um, really want to say that it is important to learn about the history um, of Cambodia and what happened here because they are really, really trying to get the word out because we are in the Western culture or the rest of the world not really being educated on this. Um, and there are a lot of reasons for it. Um, there are reasons for the government and so on to keep a lot of this a little hidden, a little on the side and not making it um, a big deal. But then you meet the people and you hear about the history and you know it is a big deal. So um, it is important to get the word out. I will do it in this podcast. I will do it in my vlog. But that's probably all that I can do. Um, there's obviously a very famous example of Angelina Jolie who had probably the same kind of experience in seeing what happened here. And um, she adopted uh, quite a few Cambodian kids and she's doing a lot of work to help Cambodia get back on its feet. Um, if you're a famous actress, you can obviously do more. I try and do my part by getting the story out um, in this, this podcast and yeah, in my vlog. So, okay, let's get to it. So I'm here in Cambodia. Um, at I'm staying at Naga World um, Hotel um, Leisure Complex. It's a five-star establishment. And I'm here for a fairly good rate. It was like $55 a night. I'm here for 17 nights. Um, and I've been doing a little bit of work here at the, uh, the World Poker Tour that was, that, that was taking place. It's now over. Um, the winner got $130,000 yesterday. Um, so I did that. And at the same time, obviously doing work on my computer, my normal job. Um, and the thing is that what happened when I got here right away, um, I had some issues. I mentioned it in the podcast before. I had some issues with um, basically it was a chemical reaction on my skin uh, caused by a mixture of a sunscreen and a mosquito spray. So I had a lot of itchy rashes on my arms and legs and um, and I got some medication and, it's, and some creams. But the thing is, like, it's still going on and it's um, it's it's yeah, it's like two weeks now almost um, and this is this is I have multiple sclerosis so these things just take longer right it's very frustrating and because of this this constant itching this constant being you know not feeling well I ended up being really unmotivated so um, I didn't get as much work done as I wanted to get done and obviously if you I just started my own business in May so I have to learn to get over this kind of stuff and just because I just I can't as much as I want to, I shouldn't be so discouraged and um, and still pick myself up and get, you know, get shit done, just get it done, you know. Um, so I was in a, in a quite a bad place and I didn't even want to really go out and do sightseeing. I just wanted to uh, be by myself and just try and get rid of th these ugly rashes on my arms and so on. But yeah, um, because obviously I'm, I'm here to also record some video footage um, for my client because I'm producing some videos for them. Obviously, I also wanted to do something for my vlog and show where I'm at. And obviously, I'm interested in what's out there. 
Um, so I went on Expedia. Uh, so so normally I, I always go on Expedia um, when I when I book travels or like um, you know things to do in a place because they usually have a lot of things that have been vetted in a way that uh, there's reviews you know so it's uh, I've done it before that I booked something through the hotel I was in and then in the end the tour was really bad because um, they just don't put the same effort in and I just don't have any you know any reviews of it so I prefer booking it through Expedia and when I went through all the tours on Expedia, a lot of them mentioned the killing fields and the prison and all that. And I, because I didn't know anything about Cambodian history, I was like, okay, because that was obviously they mentioned genocide, that I was like, I, I don't know, I don't want to really see that. You know, I don't want to re, um, spend my sightseeing day seeing that kind of stuff. Um, and also because I had to shoot some footage of the city. It was more important for me to, to actually see like the city life, the hustle and bustle, some food, some temples, you know, like that kind of stuff. And not necessarily, because you can't really film something like that and uh, make it look nice in a promotional video of sorts, right? So I specifically tried to pick a tour that did not do the killing fields and, uh, and the prison. Um, so it didn't mention that in there. It was like it said it was a, a small group co um, Cambodian history tour, and I was like, okay, <laughs> so um, this will probably show me the city and tell about the history, right? Um, but what it ended up being was exactly only the prison and the killing fields. Um, and when, once I realized that, I was like, oh damn, this is exactly what I did not want to do. And then I just had to deal with it. It was a four hour tour. In total, I think it was like six hours with the drive and all that. Um, so I put my camera away because I knew this is not going to be what I had uh, come out for to, to get footage of, of the city. But this is actually going to educate me about the history of um, Cambodia and Phnom Penh. And um, I just basically surrendered to that and it's like, okay, hit me, show me, uh, educate me. So one thing that our tour guide said straight away was there are certain things that she can tell us while we are uh, in the prison and in the, at the killing fields. But um, as soon as we will talk about political things, she asked us not to ask any questions um, in public because she could get she could get into trouble talking about that in public. Um, and she asked us only to ask these kind of questions on the bus because she could only tell us certain things on the bus and that was already quite um yeah for for a westerner let's say it's a very strange thing to say because we do have free speech in most places where we're at and if we want to stand in the middle of the road and criticize our government we can do that right that was already a little bit of a warning sign that this day is going to be different from what i had originally expected so we arrived, the first stop was at the S21 prison. And I am going to give you a little bit of background now on Cambodian history. I'm going to try and do it justice and, and roll through it quite fast. Obviously, if you are interested in more details, there's a world of information out there that you can read on. Or maybe actually not a world of information because a lot of this is being hidden a little bit. And um, people, I think, are hoping a little bit that some of it will be forgotten. but. Um, yeah, anyway, so let's, I will try and give it justice and tell you the history of, the recent history of Cambodia, um, how shit went down, basically. So while in Vietnam, which is a bordering country of Cambodia, um, the famous Vietnam War happened um, and the Americans were very busy bombing this whole area. There was bombings in La Laos and uh, obviously in Vietnam, but also a lot of it was in Cambodia because there were some very important routes that were serving Vietnam. So the U.S. planes were dropping bombs in the north of Cambodia in a in incredibly massive, horrendous way. And it was done in a way that um, a lot of the decision makers back in the U.S. weren't even aware of. So a lot of unfortunate stuff happened there in the north of this, this country that had been prosperous and happy. And it was basically the jewel or the pearl 
of Southeast Asia and everybody looked at Cambodia as the um, um, a fruitful, happy place to be in and to go to. And the president at the time was worried that the war could spill over and tried all kinds of things to get help to, to spare um, Cambodia. Um, but yeah, so it did happen and the, the bombs were dropped in the, in the north of Cambodia. And that is exactly where a, I will just call them a terrorist group called Khmer Rouge were based. So they were in the north of, of Cambodia. It was still a very small group um, of, of people and the leader of them had had been to Paris in the past and he had studied a lot of political um, topics and he was fascinated by uh, communist um, structures and uh, especially the thought of um, an agricultural system where a country should, should be an agri agricultural power basically having most of its people live in the country and work in the country and um, yeah basically an older communist um, system that that he was aiming for and he was advertising for um, so he, he grew a little bit of a following up there in the north I don't know how many people those were exactly but once the bombings happened he used that um, to basically brainwashed the locals in that area, saying the Americans are trying to destroy us. They're coming back to destroy us. Because a lot of the people had never heard sounds like that, never seen things like that. So they were literally shell-shocked and people lost their minds. And uh, Pol Pot, who the, the name of that, the leader uh, of the Khmer Rouge, um, he started telling people, this is the Americans, they're trying to get us. and. Um, because he kept speaking to them and it, for them it sounded like the truth because they could see the destruction and all that, they started following him. And so bit by bit, the Khmer Rouge they worked their way from the north of Cambodia, worked their way south. And while they were doing that, they also started getting the, um, the support of the Vietnamese um, because they were all like anti US. So the Vietnamese helped them with some, some uh, military um, forces as well to strengthen them. Um, so they, they kept working their way south and a bit like a snowball basically just gaining more and more people along the way and more and more followers along the way because they could still spread that message, hey, we're here to fight back the, the Americans. And basically by the time they, they got to Phnom Penh uh, in the south, uh, the Vietnam War had ended and basically the Americans were chased away or defeated. So they all celebrated. The Vietnamese went, went back to Vietnam because they didn't really uh, need to support the Cambodians anymore. And the Khmer Rouge came into Phnom Penh with like, they had tanks and, and, and military vehicles and they were sitting on there celebrating, yay, we made it, we got rid of the Americans, so we're safe. But then it only took like two hours or something. It, it, it's just, if you listen to this stuff, it's just mind blowing. So they, the Khmer Rouge like took two hours of like celebrating together with the people. And then they jumped off their, uh, of the tanks and all that and suddenly pulled the guns on the people of Phnom Penh and said they had to leave the city right now. Like get their get their belongings and leave the city. They, they basically told them the Americans are coming back um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how exactly it, it happened. They must have said, yeah, we beat the Americans and oh, we just got word. They are coming back and they are going to bomb, they are going to bomb the city. So they, they managed in, I don't know how long it took, um, they managed in the shortest of time to move everybody out of the city of Phnom Penh. Everybody had to take their belongings and start walking. And the plan was to get them out into the, into the country countryside and into the fields and start working in the fields. So for a lot of the Cambodian people at the time, it still sounded like they were trying to help. You know, it still sounded like they are trying to save them from some bad stuff that could happen and some bombings or something. And um, they were all, they're all going to have work and food. And it, it probably a couple of them had their doubts, but a lot of them were still following what they've been told because they thought they were trying to help. And obviously what they didn't know was all the stuff that happened um, behind the scenes. And this is obviously being a German, we have our fair share of history like that, where 
you're being told one thing um, and you support that, but you don't know all the other stuff that's happening on, uh, in, the, in hiding that you're not aware of. So here it ended up being that the Khmer Rouge basically started killing everybody who opposed them and started killing everybody who was intelligent, who was sophisticated, um, who had any kind of international influence, who was speaking a different language, because they wanted to have people work in the fields and they didn't need intelligent people to work in the fields. They needed people that follow their orders and just do the heavy physical work and that's it. So what they started building here was a network of 300 prisons that were basically torture devices. They called them uh, education camps, I think, or education centers. Um, so they sent all these people into those prisons and tortured them in the most horrendous ways. And um, most of them didn't survive that, of course, or basically almost all of them. But yeah, so the first stop of our tour was to go to the S21 prison. And the thing is, from all these 300 prisons, as far as I know, only this one is left. So the Cambodians make sure that this is still something that people can see. And they try and educate people of what happened during the uh, Khmer Rouge um, regime. So they want to educate everybody, the tourists. And I realized then that it is obviously that's why almost all the tours that you can find on Expedia have this as part of it because it is such an important message to get out and this information should go out. So we got to this prison and were told in the most gruesome detail, and I'm going to spare you with that, in the most gruesome detail how the people were, were tortured in these cells. Um, and they don't spare you. It's like there's there's pictures on the walls of, of corpses in, in the worst states possible um, and the details that I've learned on what happened to those humans it is absolutely horrendous and it was um, it was impossible to go through that um, without just losing faith in mankind and humanity it's like how can humans be capable of that of treating other humans like that you know and the problem was that part of it was those people that were actually the torturers were being forced to do that because they were being told, if you don't do this, you will be the one being tortured. So they were being forced doing that. And a lot of them were children. So they actually made, like, they said 8 to 15-year-olds are easy to mold. So they forced those kids, actual kids, to do the torturing. So a lot of absolute horrible, horrible stuff. And again, I'm, I'm going to spare you with the details. Those, those are going to be stuck in my head for forever. Um, and if you, if, you are, if you do have the stomach for this kind of stuff, um, obviously, you know, you, there's liter literature around it. You can come to Cambodia yourself and go to this, to this prison to, to learn about it. It's shocking. It's horrendous. It just lets you lose all faith in, in mankind and in humanity when you hear what they did to the people there. And in this, this single prison, this S21 prison, it's been said that uh, about 20,000 people were moved through this, this prison and basically nobody survived. Um, it's, they, they died right there or they were sent to the killing fields to be killed there and that's it. Um, but Apparently, by the time that in the end, um, when the Khmer Rouge regime fell, which was, by the way, um, the Vietnamese that were in the beginning supporting them learned at some point what they were doing here and actually came back to, to save the Cambodian people from this group that they originally supported. So this is a very interesting part of, um, of history as well. that. They say, oh my God, we supported those guys. We didn't know what they actually had planned the whole time. Um, so they came back to free the Cambodians of the Khmer Rouge. So by the time that happened, obviously almost everybody was dead in that prison. But when the people came in, they found seven 
seven survivors, seven people um, were still alive at the time. And out of those seven, two of them, for the last two years or something, come to this prison every single day and they come back to this place where they had been tortured in the most horrendous and horrific ways and they come back to tell people about it because they need to have the word out. They need to want people to know what happened during this regime. The one guy, um, I think he's probably in his mid-80s now, he saw us walk towards him and he bowed and he smiled and um, it, was, it just broke my heart. It's really something... Um, Knowing what he went through and seeing him smile and be positive and trying to do the, the right thing, sitting just meters away from, from the worst thing that you could ever think could happen to a human being. And this happened to him and he comes back just to make sure that people know. It's, it's mind-blowing and again, this is something when on the one hand you think what humans are capable of in the way that they are, the torturing people, but also what humans are capable of when you see this tortured person standing up, having endured all that, and then sitting there telling it's his story in a book, you could buy his book, and looking into people's eyes saying, I've gone through this and I'm here to tell you about it. It's, um, it's yeah, it's, again, it's mind blowing on both sides how people can endure that and still be a functioning hum human being. Um, and yeah, how people can actually perform that. Um, and the other guy, so both of them, I think were like in their eighties. The other guy only survived basically because he could draw really well. And he was drawing um, a picture of Paul Pot, um, and they kept him alive so that he could just do drawings for them. And one thing that he also drew was a picture of a soldier killing his wife, like the way how he slit his wife's throat. He actually made a painting of that and has the face in a lot of details and he remembers the face of that guy. And then he pointed at a photo and we were told that this guy, this guy who killed his wife and made him watch is still working in the Cambodian government today. And again, all of this was just, um, I, yeah, it's, I'm speechless because it's something I've never thought I would see and, and hear and experience. And especially because I was not aware of this history. So I went into this tour and suddenly I learned all of this and it was, um, it was an absolute shock and I'm still in shock. I'm still, I'm still not over it. I don't know how long it's going to take. When I spoke to some people and said I was at, in the prison and uh, the, the killing fields, they, uh, they said, oh, it's going to take a while till you get over that. Um, so after we, we left the prison and we completely, yeah, completely shocked about all this, we could obviously ask a couple of questions about the political situation. And the, the issue is a little bit that a lot of the former Khmer Rouge people are still in today's government in Cambodia. And... Basically, the Cambodians know that, but they they just simply stay quiet and stay still and just just wait for it, you know, because it looks like Cambodia is getting back on its feet. When I'm here, I'm um, again like I'm here in my hotel and I look out the window, and I see a lot of buildings being built, a lot lot of new high rises, um, expensive hotels. Um, it looks like Cambodia is slowly getting back up on its feet and I think the Cambodians don't want to stir things up so they'd rather just keep quiet. They know that a lot of the people that were involved have never been prosecuted or um, sanctioned or whatever in any way. They just, let's say, let's move on. We, we make sure that people know about the history but let's just move on and nobody would benefit of an uprising because it's just simply it is on a good way so let's just stay quiet and hope for the best. So that's what we learned from her um, and that was on the way to the killing fields and to be honest because it was so graphic what we saw in the prison 
that was more shocking than the actual killing fields. So once again, there were many, many, many killing fields and there's only a few left and they don't know where else there are these mass graves um, scattered around around the city, somewhere in the countryside. They probably will dig up more and more over the years, the more development is happening. Um, but we went to this one place and basically what happened was that they had trucks full of prisoners that they just brought to these places, which they called training camps or training centers. And I'm not sure how much the people knew, by the way. It's like there were pictures in the prison as well of people when they got arrested. They took a picture of every person that got arrested and they had all these pictures lined up of all the prisoners that went into that prison and never came out basically and I looked at the faces in those pictures and there was no fear which really surprised me because um, I would think if you get arrested and you know what will happen to you that you would look fearful but none of the people had fear in their eyes and either that meant they didn't know what was going to happen. They were completely oblivious to what was going to happen. Or they were so full of anger and hate and defiance that fear just didn't have a place. So that was that was something I realized when I looked at those faces. I didn't see fear. And maybe that was the similar thing when the people were brought to the so-called training camp. Um, because obviously people were told that they are going to work in the fields, you know, so they are being brought out into the fields. And I'm just wondering if they knew what was going to happen. So basically they arrived and at that killing field that we went to, at a rate of 300 people a day, they were just slaughtered and dumped and that's it. So if they couldn't make 300 a day because, you know, there were too many people coming in, they actually had to stay there overnight and then being killed the next day. So when we went there, there's this one big building where they all the skulls and bones that they find, they put on display. I actually just saw it from the outside. I was like, I have no, no need to go in there and actually see it up close. Um, and then we went out to actually walk around and they explained to us how the people got killed and they showed us an example of one of the mass graves and they explained in detail how the people were killed and dumped. And it was, again, um, you don't know what to think and to say, right? Because it's just so horrible. And then they mentioned as well that these examples that they showed us of the mass graves are just small examples, while where we were walking at that moment was basically on more mass graves. So she explained to us that every time it rains, there's uh, bones and jaw bones and clothing of the dead people just coming up to the surface every time it rains. And she pointed out a tooth, like you see that next to the leaf, that's a tooth. And then there was some clothing that you could see like sticking in the ground. And then they had built a little bit of a walkway above the ground so that you're not actually walking on the grave but you still knew that everything under your feet, everything underneath was basically full of dead people. And again, like she gave us so many details about how the women and the children and the babies were killed. So it's, it's not just, they didn't just kill intelligent males. You know, like they, they actually went through and said, like, oh, if, if you wear glasses, it means you can read. So you get killed. If you had no calluses on your hands, so you're not a worker, you get killed. If your skin was lighter, meant you were not working in the fields, you got killed. It's the whole extent of this is so mind-blowingly horrifying. In total, over a course of, it was about three and a half years, they killed almost 2 million Cambodians. And it's like 25% or 20, yeah, about 20% of the total population of Cambodia, they just killed off right there. 
in three and a half years. And in this short of a time span, they basically ruined this country for a long time to come. They, they made so much damage in this country, which is, it's, you just can't grasp what happened here. And yeah, and then after we, we finished this, this horrible tour, um, I was, for a second, I was sitting with a guide uh, alone and I asked her, I was like, how often do you do this? How often do you tell this story? Because this is horrible. And then she said she's, she's doing it quite often, but she's doing it to make sure that people know. And she's doing it to honor her family because she lost her grandfather and her grandmother and her, her uncle. And they all got killed. And she wants to do her part, just as the two surviving prisoners that were sitting there in the prison talking about what they had to endure there, she wants to do her part to make sure that people know and the word gets out. Because one thing she explained as well is that Cambodians don't learn in school about this. So if, if kids actually show any interest in the prison or the killing fields, the teachers would have to, on their own, drive the kids in their own car out there. It's not part of the official education in Cambodia that you learn about this part of the history. So it's being kept quite a bit under wraps. It's obviously being acknowledged that it happened. You can't like deny it, but you can see only one prison is basically left and only a few of these killing fields are still being preserved to, to show the world what happened. But a lot of it is being being kept quiet, and um, so it is up to the people to to get the word out. And yeah, there is the example, as I mentioned before, Angelina Jolie had a movie about that, um, which is was being built on on a, a book. First, they killed my father. That's I think that's the title of it. Um, and I haven't seen it, but I've been told that it's also very shocking, and um, you have to be quite strong to watch it. So, yeah, I, I was thrown into this without knowing about any of this. And as I said, I'm still right now fighting with tears, just telling you this, because it's been, it's been a very, very hard um, reality to face, um, something that we don't know about. And it's, it's these people's reality still today. People live with this. And when I spoke to my guide and I said, listen, like, I, um, I don't want to compare this, but because I'm from Germany, I have, um, we have quite a similar fucked up history like this. And then she said, oh, yeah, I've once heard, yeah, the, the Germans did something like that with the Jews, right? And I'm like, yes. It's, it was an interesting reaction to something for, again, for us Westerners. This piece of history is probably the biggest piece of history that everybody is aware of and the, the horrendous things that happened during the Holocaust. And for her, it was just a side note because that is not her reality. Her reality is what happened here. And this stuff, which was even because it was a world war and there was, I mean, again, it doesn't matter if it's four million people being killed or two million people, it's horrible as it is. Um, but it's even a, a bigger thing that most of the world is sort of aware of, you would think, and she did not know, like, I mean, she did sort of know about it, but it's not this big reality as it is for me, for example. And um, she said that the only thing that they learn here in school is about the Cold War, just between America and Russia. That's what they learn about, and that's it. That's the only history that they really learn about. So they don't have a comparison, they don't know how the rest of the world looks like and what other things have happened that are comparable to this. This is their reality. This is their horrible, horrible history that they have to deal with for decades and generations to come. And as I know that from Germany, it's like I'm only two generations removed. My grandfather was fighting in the, in the war. Um, and still with me, this is still a painful history. And it still will be for at least one more generation, if not two more generations. So because for Cambodia, this has only been one generation ago, 
this will still take a while. Um, and obviously you can start building more and more high rises and skyscrapers and five star hotels in Phnom Penh, but this part of history is not going to go away. And it's, I'm impressed and in awe of the people that keep telling the story because it is such a horrible, horrendous story, but it needs to be told. It needs to be known that this, this happened um, because nobody really was punished. Um, and yeah, so I didn't even notice Pol Pot was, um, was actually sort of arrested at some point and they did find him and they wanted to get him on trial, but he had a heart attack on the day of the trial. So again, you can just start arguing. It's probably not, it probably hasn't been a heart attack, um, but he got out of it cheaply. Um, and a lot of the other people that were involved um, are still in the, uh, still alive and still working in the government. Um, again, you don't know how much they actually wanted to do what they did and how much they were forced to do what they did. But this, again, this part of history will take a long time till it concludes in a way. It's, um, this is basically, it, the whole thing reads like a movie script that just hasn't ended yet. And I really hope for Cambodia that this is gonna, this is gonna shake up and the whole thing will be back to where they were before all that happened, a prosperous, beautiful, happy country. So that was basically why I called this reality is relative, right? Just again, having these two prisoners telling their stories and keeping this reality, this very, very real life experience, keeping it real and alive by coming back to this prison every day to make sure to share the story and tell the story. Um, it's their reality, it's who they are. And I was thinking, what is the alternative, right? They would sit at home and having these thoughts in their heads and these memories in their heads. Can you ever live a day not thinking about what happened? So it's probably the best for them to actually go and share the story. But it's, it's just such a punch in the gut if you think about they go back to that actual place where that happened. So I, yeah, I'm speechless and how, how they can stomach that, how they can actually deal with that reality every single day. They go back there every single day. And then again with a tour guide, her family basically was killed and she's doing her part um, in sharing that reality and that history with the world to make sure that people know while not actually knowing a lot about, for example, the, the Second World War and the Hitler regime and what the Nazis did. So because it doesn't matter for her, this is her reality. This is what happened here. This is what happened to her family. This is still happening today. So this is her reality and again it was it was inspiring as much as shocking that um, these people put so much effort into getting the word out and sharing the story and yeah after that tour i went back to my five-star hotel with metal detectors at the entrance and felt ashamed i felt like um, i didn't deserve going to this five-star hotel while looking down on, on, on the city and on this country with this horrible history that happened. Basically, it ended the year I was born. It ended in 79. That's when I was born. So it's so fresh and such a young history. And, well, I just roll up into my five-star hotel. And what I did then, I poured myself a whiskey and uh, went in a complete rabbit hole watching YouTube videos on Cambodian history to just fill in some of the gaps because obviously she was explaining us a lot of stuff um, but she had also had a very thick accent so sometimes some some things might just pass by so I made sure to really 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 understand what happened here and educate myself um, so that I can do my part because um, I can't give money. I mean, obviously I can give some money, but it's, that's usually not really the biggest of help. I think what helps, what, because that's what they are working for, is to help spread the word and make sure the, the story um, is out there. 
So yeah, so it's it's more than four days after I went on this tour, and I'm still shaken by it. You know, I'm still it will this will still take a while to not wake up and immediately think about it. Like I'm trying to meditate and immediately think about what happened here. It's like it's so it had such a shocking impact on my own reality here at the moment. Um, and I'm going to probably take that with me for quite a while. And yeah, yesterday I went to do some more sightseeing because I really needed to get a little bit of, not just, you know, not just for the video, but also for me, I needed to see a little bit actually of Phnom Penh, of the city. So I went to do just some self-made sightseeing. So I decided to grab it and uh, go to the very first stop, um, which was the Wat Phnom, I think was the name, the the main temple that in the end was um, what named the city. And then I went with another grab to the central market, got some some impressions there. And then I went to the royal palace. I couldn't go inside, but I saw a little bit of that. And then I walked along the river, um, which ends then in the Mekong, river delta um, and walked all the way back um, to the hotel and on the way i saw a lot of um, obviously you see a lot of beggars a lot of them which i found interesting um, don't want to sell you something like something physical they want to sell you information so a lot of them walk up to you and tell you interesting facts about what you're looking at because this is what they have they don't have a product to sell you they have knowledge they would like you to, to have and I found that quite interesting as well now and I was I had to be quite brash because I really just wanted some quick impressions and um, it's hard to say no um, and a lot of people that approached me had um, missing limbs and I know that there's a lot of landmines still around Cambodia so I know that a lot of these injuries with like missing legs specifically were because of landmines um, and it's hard and it's still something again this is this is this is their reality this is what they have to face every day and, and i think as long as i'm still in this country i'm facing it every day even if i'm not out in the streets if i'm in my five star bunker here safe from from any harm but i am still in this reality as long as i'm here and i'm flying back at the weekend to germany and then probably slowly but surely i will shake this off and uh, and not be so shaken by this anymore but what this did in the end um, and it's absolutely again it's such a weird thing to happen because you watch your own psychological mental um, response to all of this right so I had gone into this in a very unmotivated state because I was just in some way sad that I had this rash on my skin and I couldn't focus properly on work and I couldn't really leave and face other people because I was ashamed because of that rash and I was in a really bad mood, unmotivated. And then I see that and that just slapped me back into reality and into freaking perspective because what the fuck? Why am I upset? I'm sitting in a five-star hotel being upset about a rash on my arms uh, and then I learn about that. So I was slapped back into perspective and reality. Um, I was slapped by reality into perspective, let's say it that way. And it's, I, I think I mentioned this before, I do this when every day in my meditation exercise, I do this visualization where I imagine that I'm zooming out of the planet and I'm in space and I look at the stars and the planets and the and eternity. And then I zoom back into where I am and really feel like, okay, this is where I am, what I am, who I am, and this is, this is the place I'm at, um, to gain perspective so that I'm not being thrown off by um, a broken telephone screen or I don't know what, you know, so just gaining perspective on there's this vast universe, you're just this little part in this little part of the universe. So get a grip, basically. So I'm constantly doing these perspective exercises to keep myself from being upset about bullshit. 
But this was a wake-up call that I didn't expect. And I came out of this, this horrible experience with motivation. So once I didn't sleep, the first night I didn't really sleep properly. I had nightmares from all that. And then I woke up and I was, I was suddenly motivated and driven to get after it again and actually do shit and do stuff and get shit done because I am so privileged. I am so lucky with who I am, what I have, the skills I have, the the secure background I have and all that, all this opportunity that I'm having and I should fucking not be upset about my little problems if you know what other people have gone through and are still going through. So it is an absolutely weird thing to know that having basically walked on a mass grave and met a tortured prisoner in person that that's what it takes to become motivated that is horrible and it shouldn't be like that and I really hope that I can come out of this and it will have a positive impact on me for a very long time that I can call this back this this memory back and really think about is this really something I should be upset about right now and sad about or is this really something that that should bring me down right now when all this here is somebody else's reality. So this is going to be with me for a very long time. And um, I know it's difficult to bring this message across if you haven't experienced that yourself, but maybe I, I hope I did a fairly good job in telling you about the history of Cambodia and about what happened here and about the heaviness of this place and living through experiences like this and maybe it helps you as well to gain some perspective and just don't take things too seriously that are not really important and think about what really matters you know Um, and I can only really really recommend I know it's heavy it's not entertainment it's not like a funny family guy episode that is sort of critical and sort of shows you the evil in the world but still makes you laugh. If you go into this and learn about Cambodian history, it is going to be heavy and dark and absolutely demoralizing when it comes to looking at mankind and human history. So (laughs) I want to really, really encourage you to do this and go through it and just buckle down for a little bit, stay strong, learn about the history of a country that has gone through absolutely horrendous stuff and really, really learn about it. Take these learnings into your everyday life and if you, even if you don't have to spread the actual story of Cambodia, maybe you can take your learnings and then spread them Um, throughout people in your network and make sure that they learn that they are privileged and they have so much opportunity and um, live a more productive and happy life and just know how you know how good your life is and it's it's a weird thing for me because I know Germany is a country that is quite negative people are quite negative in Germany it's one of the main reasons why I don't live there anymore I don't want to live there anymore, really, because I don't want to have negative people around me. So I think this is going to be quite hard for me. Um, I'm only going to spend about a week um, back in Germany before I continue travel for a bit. But it's going to be quite hard for me after having seen this and experienced this to go back to a country that is so negative and saying, you guys don't even know how well you got out of all this, you know, because... Imagine Germany would have ended the same way as Cambodia with this basically the same kind of history a similar very similar kind of history Germany picked itself up and became a massive uh, in massively influential industrial state Completely not comparable to what Cambodia ended up being so it will be strange to have these two countries with a similar kind of history 
um, one being 50 years older than the other one, the history, and see the difference of how people are reacting. You know, and obviously there's a difference in Germany. We learn about that history in the smallest detail so that we know, that we remember, that we make sure this is not happening again. Well, as a side note, it is happening again right now because it's happening everywhere in the world. Um, but yes, it will be strange. It will be a strange cultural difference coming from Cambodia, going back to Germany and having to deal with negative people that don't even know how how good they have it. Okay, this was a longer podcast episode than expected, but no, not that expected. I knew, I knew this was going to go longer because this is something I feel like I needed to get it off my chest as well, and I, I wanted to do my part in a way to share the story and to tell the world um, about Cambodia and its history. And I really hope that... Um, more of you will be able to learn about this and um, yeah, make sure that history is not being hidden and reality is not being obscured and brushed away. That's it, yeah, and as I said, um, I came out of it with motivation and a drive, which is weird, but I did, so I'm going after it. I have more stuff to do this week here. I'm going to work a lot more on video editing, audio editing, there's a lot of things like that. Um, my client here gave me a lot more work um, for the future, which is great, so I'm my, my reality as a digital nomad is being more and more secured um, for the future, and... Um, I will be back in Cambodia next year because I want to see Angkor Wat. I didn't have time this year to go see it. So I'm definitely going to be back in Cambodia next year. And we'll see how I feel about this um, once I get back. But for now, I'm going to say goodbye from Cambodia, from Phnom Penh. Um, and the next time you're going to hear from me is going to be from Germany, good old Germany, uh, from Hanover, where I'm going to stay for about a week at my brother's place. Um, before then traveling on again to Prague in Czech Republic. So I say goodbye from Phnom Penh in Cambodia, my last stop of this round the world trip. Goodbye from Asia and I speak to you soon again when I'm back in Europe. Bye!